years, I've been feeling frustrated because as a religious historian, I, I've become acutely aware that of the centrality of compassion in all the major world faiths. Every single one of them has evolved their own version of what's been called the golden rule. Sometimes it comes in a positive version. Always treat all others as you'd like to be treated yourself. And equally important is the negative version. Don't do to others what you would not like them to do to you. Look into your own heart, discover what it is that gives you pain, and then refuse under any circumstance whatsoever to inflict that pain on anybody else. And people have uh, emphasized the importance of compassion, not just because it sounds good, but because it works. People have found that when they have implemented the golden rule, as Confucius said, all day and every day, not just a question of doing your good deed for the day and then returning to a life of greed and uh, egotism, uh, but to do it all day and every day, you dethrone yourself from the center of your world, put another there, and you transcend yourself. Uh, and it brings you into the presence of what's been called God, Nirvana, Raman, Dao, uh, something that goes beyond what we know in our ego-bound existence. But you know, you'd never know it a lot of the time that this was so central to the religious life. Because with a few uh, wonderful exceptions, very often when religious people come together, religious leaders come together, they're arguing about abstruse doctrines uh, or uttering a counsel of hatred or inveighing against uh, homosexuality or something of that sort. Often people don't really want to be compassionate. Uh, I sometimes see when I'm speaking to a, a congregation of religious people, a sort of mutinous expression crossing their faces because people often want to be right instead. Um, uh, and that, that, of course, defeats the object of the exercise. Now, why was I so grateful to Ted? Because, um, because it, they took me very gently uh, from my book line study and brought me into the 21st century, enabling me to speak to a much, much wider audience than I could have ever conceived, because I feel an urgency about this. If we don't manage to implement the golden rule globally so that we treat all peoples, wherever and whoever they may be, as though they were as important as ourselves, I doubt that we'll have a viable world to hand on to the next generation. The task of our time, one of the great tasks of our time, is to build a global society, as I said, that where people can live together in peace. And the religions uh, that should be making a major contribution are instead seen as part of the problem. Uh, and, of course, uh, it's not just uh, religious people who believe in the golden rule. This is the source of all morality, this imaginative act of empathy, putting yourself in the place of another. And so we have a choice, it seems to me. We can either go on uh, it bringing out or emphasizing the dogmatic and intolerant aspects of our faith, or we can... Um, Go back to the rabbis, Rabbi Hillel, uh, the older contemporary of Jesus, who when asked by a pagan uh, to uh, sum up the whole of Jewish teaching while he stood on one leg, said, that which is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. That is the Torah and everything else is only commentary. Um, and the rabbis and the early fathers of the church who said that any interpretation of scripture that bred hatred and disdain was illegitimate. Uh, we need to revive that spirit. And it's not just going to happen because a spirit of love wafts us down. We have to make this happen, and we can do it with the modern communications that Ted has introduced. Already, I've been tremendously heartened at the response of all our partners in Singapore uh, we have uh, the, uh, a group 
are use, going to use the charter to heal divisions recently uh, that have sprung up in Singaporean society, and some members of the parliament want to implement it uh, politically. Uh, in Malaysia, there's, uh, there's going to be an art exhibition in which leading artists are going to, to be taking uh, people, young people, and showing them that, that compassion also lies at the root of all art. In, uh, throughout Europe, uh, the Muslim communities are holding events and discussions uh, discussing the centrality of compassion in Islam and in all faiths. But it can't stop there, it can't stop with the launch. Religious teaching, this is where we've gone so wrong, concentrating solely on believing abstruse doctrines. Religious teaching must be always lead to action. And uh, I intend to work on this till my dying day. And um, I, I, I want to continue with our partners uh, to uh, do two things, educate uh, and, in, uh, and stimulate compassionate thinking. Education, because people, we've so uh, dropped out of compassion, people often think it simply means feeling sorry for somebody. But of course, you don't understand compassion if you're just going to think about it. You also have to do it. I want them to get the media involved, because the media are crucial in helping to dissolve such, some of the stereotypical views we have of other people, which are dividing us from one another. Uh, same applies uh, to educators. I'd like youth to get uh, a sense of the dynamism, the dynamic and challenge of a compassionate lifestyle, and also see that it demands acute intelligence, not just a gooey feeling. Um, I'd like to call upon scholars to explore the compassionate uh, theme in the, their own and in other people's traditions. And perhaps above all, to encourage a sensitivity about uncompassionate speaking. So that because people have this charter, whether, or whatever their beliefs or lack of them, they feel empowered to challenge uncompassionate speech, disdainful remarks from their religious leaders, their political leaders, from the captains of industry. Uh, because we can change the world, we have the ability. Uh, I, I would never have thought of putting the charter online. I was still stuck in the old world of a whole bunch of boffins sitting together in a room and issuing yet another arcane statement. And Ted uh, introduced me to a whole new way of thinking and presenting ideas, because that's what is so wonderful about Ted. In this room, uh, uh, all this expertise, uh, uh, if we joined it all together, we can change the world. And of course, the problems are in super, uh, sometimes seem insuperable. But I'd just like to quote, uh, fi finish at the end, with a reference to uh, a British author, an Oxford author, whom I don't speak, uh, quote very often, C.S. Lewis. Uh, but he wrote one thing that stuck in my mind when, ever since I read it when I was a schoolgirl. It's in his book, The Four Loves. He said that uh, wh wh he distinguished between erotic love when two people gaze spellbound into each other's eyes. Uh, and then he compared that to friendship, when two people stand side by side, as it were, shoulder to shoulder, with their eyes fixed on a common goal. We don't have to fall in love with each other, but we can become friends. Uh, and it's, I am convinced, I felt it very strongly uh, during our de deliberations at Veve, uh, that when we, People of all different persuasions uh, come together, uh, working side by side for a common goal. Differences meld away, and we learn uh, amity, uh, and we learn to live together and to get to know one another. Thank you very much.